All right, so jumping in, um, if anyone, if someone has actually never seen or read anything that you've done, what is the first thing you want them watching or reading and why? I, I, don't, I don't know. I want them to think it's good. I, I'd want them to think it's distinctive. I'd want them to think you can tell it's by me. And uh, I certainly want them to uh, think that it's not, you know, many hands Hollywood product or something. It was done by me, an individual human writer. I, I completely, completely get it. Um, jumping into why, I get, actually, one other question. If you could get the financing to make anything you want tomorrow, what would you make and why? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. Because, you know, that, that kind of is out there. If you actually, you know, want to pursue it and do stuff like that. I think I'd, I'd do something... Um, Probably historical, probably set in the Regency era. Um, whether it be something along the lines of my Tripoli, which never got made uh, for exactly. various reasons, or uh, another thing I had that was set during the War of 1812 in the, uh, in the Pacific Ocean. And I, I think it would be a big thing like that, sort of a big Robert Balty, David Laney sort of thing, which is where I started from and which is where I came from. And that, the thing is, like, uh, obviously, with all the streamers that are out there now, they're all looking for content. And I'm sort of curious, this because I knew about Tripoli. I've known you wanted to make that for forever. Is it something that you've actually tried? Because I don't know who owns the rights anymore. Is it something that you've actually tried to re-pursue now that all these streamers are looking for, you know, the content? No, because at this point, when you th when you think about it, if I opened it right now, I'd have to completely rewrite it. You know, it was good enough to take everything by storm and get me into the industry then. But if I read it now, would I would I like it? Would I want to change it? Because... You know, uh, mostly artists get worse. Sometimes they get better, right? And I, I think I've had the luxury of getting a little better as a writer. And however effective that script was as a, you know, call it a Lawrence of Arabia that really moved, you know, it was sort of a, you know, sort of a, sort of a David Lean epic paced like a Bond film, right? I mean, it was, it was a good script. It worked. But if I looked at it now, I'd, I'd want to do it all over again. I mean, it'd be like somebody, uh, you know, looking at an old album they made 20 years ago. You know, what we, you might not be able to stand it. You know, who was this young punk who wrote this? Look at all the mistakes he made. Or maybe not. I might be surprised. Um, the other thing I'd like to do is a uh, a western, sort of a black powder western, and uh, I've been messing around with that. And uh, you know, I I've been doing a little bit of TV, a lot of other things. Have a lot of stuff in development. I've I've learned not to announce it. Understand. You know, especially these days, because if you announce something, all of a sudden a preconception gels and calcifies about what it's going to be, you know, and everybody predisposed to be critical about stuff is pre-critical about stuff. And, uh, you know, you don't really have all that much room to move. The mystery and the sacredness is gone. Yeah, I've, I've spoken to a number of other people that are more wary of saying things until they're actually going. Um, yeah. But jumping in. Yeah, it, jumping it, it makes it worse for people in the media, uh, you know, because you'd like to really tell people what you're doing. You know, I'd love to tell you what I'm doing, but I'd have to tell you off the record these days. You yep, know, because I, I, I don't want people banging off about something that's not even 
started yet, you know. I've had these conversations with a number of people that unfortunately are off the record. Um, jumping yeah. into why I get to talk to you. You are obviously adapting this from a very, very popular book um, and something that uh, critically claimed book. Um, what is actually the first steps when you are taking material like that and deciphering it down to what will make ultimately a two hour movie? Well, uh, first of all, the, uh, you know, page count is the first thing. You know, first of all, do you love it? Do you think you can do something with it? And the other thing is page count. You have to go from 500 odd pages to 115 or 120 pages, you know, a page being a minute of film. And uh, you, you uh, have to start making selections about what you're going to use and what you, what you can't use. Or I should say what you're going to have to do without, especially with such a beloved book, beloved by me also, by the way. So, um, you know, with that, what I've done with the last couple of books I've adapted, I've, I've actually... Um, flowed them in into text I can manipulate and I uh, I go through the text and I cut out what I'm not going to use I, I'm not going to use that I'm not going to use that I'm not going to use that retain almost like you're hacking it out of you know rock you okay. know if you're if you're sculpting it and you end up with what you need and all the time you're making notes even if you cut something out you you have it in your head i'm going to i'm going to use this so with the tender bar one of the things was if you look at it as the memoir it was you would have to have three actors playing jr because there was a whole section when he was a young adolescent and teenager and then there was the young man who's going getting into yale and then there was the boy who goes back to his grandfather's house. And so the teenager, unfortunately, had to go, you know, and, uh, and he had to make it work. He had to join those, join those two parts. Have, have the, the adolescence in there as sort of an implied thing, you know. Can you talk a little bit about, obviously, once Clooney gets involved, I'm sure he has notes on the script. Can you sort of talk about how you guys worked together to ultimately get to what is on screen? Well, I'll tell, I'll tell you how we worked together. I wrote the first draft. About two weeks later, I heard he was doing it. Okay. And uh, then Amazon greenlit the first draft. And apart from a little bit of voiceover, we didn't do anything at all. He just went off and shot it. That's amazing. No. Can you, I mean, I, for people I that mean, don't know. You know it's in the hand of, hands of professionals. I mean, look at the people involved. You know, they, he, he just saw that he had a shooter, which he would, you know, adjust to taste and necessity as he, as he went, making, you know, directorial choices. And, you know, he went off and did that, and God bless him for it. Made it very easy. I was going to say, for people that don't understand the industry, what you just said is almost unheard of. Yeah, well, they were ready for it. George and Grant were ready for it because they'd been trying to get it for get the project since it was published, like 15, 15 years ago. And I think Scott Rudin had it. And there may have been various attempts to, uh, uh, you know, uh, get it together, and they, they never happened, as so often happens. And then somehow uh, the rights landed at Amazon, and Amazon, uh, Ted Hope at the time, came to me and asked me if I'd like to do it, and I said, of course. And so Grant and George, who had been trying to get the script for 15 years, were then notified that there was a script now, and they took a look at it, you know, and I guess according to what they say, read it back and forth to each other on the phone. And uh, don't let me characterize their process, though. Um, and decided to do it, and here we are. One of the things that I found was uh, uh, Ben Affleck as Uncle Charlie. I felt like he was almost Chucky from Goodwill Hunting like 25 years later. 
you know, like there was almost a little bit of that character in there. Um, not, you know, not on purpose, just, but it felt a little like that. Did you notice that? Did you feel that? No, I, di- I didn't. I think it's coming from the, from the background. I mean, if there was some of that, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd look to myself more than I'd, more than I'd look to him. I mean, you know, uncle Charlie is a, is a type of tough, you know, in Charlie's case, literate, which yep. is not the case in the movie you referenced. Oh, Uncle that's Charlie right, yeah. is a is a tough, literate kind of, you know, though though their ethnicity is unspecified, you know, kind of literate, tough, working class Irish guy. And um, the uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, I can see why you'd see the see the slight similarity, but uh, you know, he's I think, doing it, I think it's. I was going to say, I think it's that scene with the psychologist in the school where I felt a little bit like I was, but you know, this is me reaching. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I have to tell you, I don't, I don't see it. No, it's, it's, <laughs> to, no, it's totally, it's totally it's, cool. You know, as, as a type, yes, but I, I think it's a, I think he's being pretty innovative in it. You know, if, if it's reminiscent in a good way, that's good. No, it's it's reminiscent in a good way for me. I it, it's yeah. anyway. Let's let's switch off that. So, um, if I'm not mistaken, Neil Jordan is shooting Marlowe, which yeah. uh, which you wrote. Um, what can you tease about that project? Because it sounds fucking cool. Sorry for my language. Well, it's it's uh, it's really cool. It's Neil Jordan doing it, which is uh, good by me. And. Um, you know, and Neil's like, Bill, do you mind if I write on it a little bit? And I'm like, no, you, you're Neil fucking Jordan, aren't you? <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, the answer, the answer is yes. So uh, I, I really like him. We met in Ireland. He's, he's off doing this in uh, Spain, of all places, Barcelona, Spain, with Liam Neeson. And... Uh, and he had the genius idea to do 1939 Los Angeles in Barcelona, which still has the trolley tracks and the old buildings and its own relics of Spanish colonial architecture. And looks a little otherworldly in the way that L.A. would have been at the time. And uh, also, when you get out into the fringes, what would have been the west side in L.A., I mean, it was all you know, uh, after it became irrigated, it became all jungly hillsides and things like that. So, you know, uh, that area of Spain uh, looks really interestingly like the Los Angeles of the of the 1930s. For, for people that aren't familiar with the story, uh, what can you tease them about it? Uh, well, it's it, Philip Marlowe, Raymond Chandler's Philip Marlowe, obviously, um, but it's not from a Chandler book. It's from the continuation of the Chandler books uh, by the Irish novelist John Banville, a brilliant, brilliant novelist uh, who does these books under the under the pen name Benjamin Black. So. John Banville is one of the world's greatest novelists. And you've got one of the world's greatest novelists doing a Raymond Chandler book. Um, you know, I went for that immediately. Oh. And uh, it, it's from a book called The Black-Eyed Blonde. And I called it simply Marlowe in the hope of a series. I mean, if you can imagine... Liam Neeson is Philip Marlowe. I can't. You know, it's one of those things that just hasn't happened before. Yeah, I, I'm All kind the of other guys did it. Now the governor's here. Right. Um, I got to stop there. I'm just going to say, yeah. as as always, uh, my time is up. As always, it is awesome to talk with you and see you. Hopefully, next time in person, and check your email. <laughs> All right, I will. 